The hour of 11, excuse me, the hour of 1 o'clock in the afternoon having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council will be called to order, and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watson? Here. Bruner? Present. Helen Terry Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we'll first take a look around here. Do we have any statements of disqualification on today's Council Member Bruner? Let me guess. <laughs> Your employment. <laughs> Correct, Mayor. Uh, let's see. Items number 18 and 19, I'm disqualified due to it relates to my employment. Thank you. Very good. Any other council members have statements of disqualifications we need to note? Very good, thank you. We'll be taking up our closed session agenda, which are items one and two on today's regular agenda. Uh, these are, excuse me, our closed session agenda, a conference with legal counsel regarding liability claims and a conference with legal counsel regarding anticipated litigation. If anyone who is with us today in chambers or online wishes to comment on either of these closed session items, this would be your opportunity to do so. Doesn't appear as if anyone in chambers wishes to do so. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? No. Very good. Thank you. What we will be doing uh, is going into a closed session at 1.30. I think what we will do at this point is take oral communication. So this would be the opportunity for anyone to address the city council on a matter not on our agenda today, but under our jurisdiction. Does anyone wish to do that? Anyone who is with us in the public, do we have anyone online who wishes to comment on their oral communication? Pardon me, Mayor. Sir. We have oral communication scheduled to commence at 1.30 after the closing. Oh, session. to commence at 1.30. My apology. Thank you for the correction. I appreciate that. We will go into closed session. We'll return at 1.30. We stand adjourned into closed session. Recording stopped. The hour of 1.30 having arrived and the council having completed its work in closed session, the clerk will call the roll to establish a quorum. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins is currently absent. A Bruner? Present. Helen Tari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. Mayor Keeley? Here. And Council Member Watkins here. is here. 1.30 having arrived, this will be the opportunity to, we'll take up oral communication. This is the opportunity for anyone to address the City Council on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda for a period of time not to exceed two minutes. Anyone who's with us in Council Chambers today wish to address us on oral communications, please approach. Good afternoon. Welcome, sir. Nice to see you again. Thank you. It's nice to be seen. My name is still usually James Ewing Whitman. You know, imagine what 8 billion humans could do to accomplish if we all work together to defeat the monsters that are around us. You know, I just wonder how many citizens understand that as a charter city, city council members, and even you, the mayor, are controlled by an unelected official who is our city manager, Mr. Huffington. You know what brought me in here five years ago? was why are we allowing military frequency weapons in civilian locations? So I can understand when people are in states of fear. I mean, I have things I'm concerned about, but well, about two years ago, I thought you could only fight, freeze, or flee, but we have this situation called fawning, and so many people seem to fawn. So I'm just wondering why the citizens are allowing uh, the city's attorney to fawn about the FCC, you know, what is it, 1996 ruling, 704, only um, complaint people can make about the frequency devices is the way they look. So there's a, you know, when you look at all the government agencies and what the damaging effects of what they're actually doing, it's just really kind of wild how five years ago there were upwards of 40 other people 
waiting to make public comments, and I don't know how many people are going to be here today. But uh, I will say I had a good time introducing myself to two uh, younger, uh, I guess, park rangers on Saturday night. They seemed to, I seemed to get their attention because they were trying to tell me about some 10 p.m. curfew, when in 1975, under the Coastal Commission Act, every individual has 24-7 access to the beaches and waterways. Anyway, it's nice to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. If there's anyone online, Ms. Bush, who wishes to address us, we'll take that person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Person online. Uh, yes, this is Garrett. Hey, in the last meeting's budget item, the mayor's head-turning statement was that taxes are paid involuntarily with no expectation of a commensurate return, and also that a fee definition is fees are a voluntary payment choice one makes to receive something in return of equal value. First of all, the public expects plenty in return for taxes, whether we voluntarily choose to use them or not, and are available to everyone. Fees are far more complicated and they may be charged for temporary or longer exclusive use of an improved city property, such as the golf course versus a city park or property rental, or as a charge for services provided, uh, which are required to be exclusively provided only by the monopoly of municipal force. It depends as to whether they are a voluntary choice and a kind of voluntary exclusive use or not, as some fees uh, as such are Eventually, uh, well, everyone has to directly or indirectly make requests and pay for them, like the many permits. The government isn't a free market with true price discovery coming from competition. Some fees, like the developer child care impact fee, provide no commensurate return to the payer, have nothing but made up vapor-like correlation justifications of required payments, and are closer to extortion and to abusive authority than a fee for service. Others, like the enormous green building fees, come about because your regulations are so darn complex, even the regular building department staff doesn't understand uh, uh, that requires extra expert staff. But then those who pay may or may not even have received any of this extra assistance, but they have to pay anyway. So anyway, there is no need, I don't think, to front run the November 5th ballot voter approval for fee and charge increases public approval initiative with more of your take your word for it so-called 100% reimbursement fees for whatever you can dream up or however you can justify it between them. Uh, because, you know, between uh, the last round of fee increases, enormous fee increases, and Measure L, it seems you have $25 million more million to play with since 2022. I would also mention uh, that the use of very selective city comparison studies to justify fees violate my rule anyway, that to never, ever, ever think that well, there's other some some other city does is any justification in itself to do anything. Thank you. you never know. Thank you very much for your, your testimony. Anyone else who is with us in chambers wish to provide oral communication? Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No one with their hand raised. No one with their hand up. We are on item three. This is a Central Coast Community Energy Annual Report. Our good friend Catherine Stedman is here, who is the Chief Communications Officer for Triple CE, which does a marvelously good job, not only in Santa Cruz County, but many counties in the Central Coast area, of getting our energy from good sources and, uh, and doing it at a responsible price. So, Ms. Stedman, welcome to the Council Chambers. Always good to see you. Thank you so much, Mayor, Council Members, staff. Um, I'm Catherine Stedman with Central Coast Community Energy. Um, and it's really a privilege to be here this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So quickly, I'll go over who 3CE is, because not everyone knows. We're a new government agency. We were formed about six years ago when all these cities and counties came together and said, what if we purchased the electricity to serve our region? Could we do it better? As a local public agency, could we be competitive in price, make greater progress on renewables, and provide investment back into our communities? I'm here today to show you how we're doing and what benefits are being offered right here in Santa Cruz. Next slide. As our agency has grown, our investment in communities has increased. Our budget for community energy programs in fiscal year 23-24 is $14 million. 
which are dollars that are available to the city and your constituents to help reduce emissions by electrifying vehicles and buildings. To date, on behalf of all of the cities and counties we serve, we've invested $2.8 billion in new renewable energy and energy storage projects, which are making the grid cleaner and helping the environment by reducing the fossil fuel emissions associated with power supply. Next slide. Some of those projects include new technologies that are pushing the envelope toward 100% clean and renewable power, like a compressed air battery storage project, which will be the largest in the world of its kind. Next slide. We have power purchase agreements in negotiation or in place to cover 80% of our annual load with renewable energy. The challenge is bringing these projects online in a timely manner due to the current backlog in California around permitting and grid connection and delays in needed transmission upgrades. Next slide. And yet so much progress is being made. If you hadn't heard, the amount of renewable energy on the grid has been exceeding customer demand in California on nearly a daily basis this spring for as many as nine hours a day. This is a huge accomplishment, and agencies like 3CE are very much a part of the reason why. Next slide. Not only are the renewable projects we've contracted with contributing to the solution, but they're also achieving cost savings for our customers. And because of a decision by our policy board last year, they are being evaluated based on their commitment to local community engagement, environmental protection, and workforce support. Next slide. In addition to providing clean power, I also talked about providing direct investment. We've paid to electrify new affordable housing projects, including 1500 Capitola Road with Midpen Housing, which provides 57 affordable housing units in the Live Oak area, and throughout our service territory this year, we've supported 200 new all-electric affordable housing units with completion dates ranging from 2024 to 2026. Another place we're investing is in agriculture. We provide funding assistance for all-electric farm equipment to replace diesel-powered pumps, tractors, and more. We've helped big and small farms in all the five counties we serve. Specifically in the city of Santa Cruz, 3CE has invested over $2 million through energy programs. And this includes projects with the city and also for all of your residents. Uh, we recently provided $150,000 for two level three chargers at the city corporation yard and have helped purchase level two chargers at the Santa Cruz library. Next slide. I really want to emphasize the offers we have in place specifically for the city itself. As you know, California has strict mandates for electrifying fleets. This is a major undertaking for local governments, and we are here to help. We have funding to help you plan how you are going to make this transition, how many EVs you'll need to purchase, and when when your vehicles will need to charge, and where they will need to charge. And after your plan is complete, we have funding to help pay for the vehicles and the charging infrastructure you'll need. And we're finding that fleet managers are really welcoming the assistance. Next slide. Actually, next slide. Thank you. Um, we're also, I think, maybe in the other direction. Is that right? One more? OK. All right. Um, I do want to note that we are hosting a quarterly call for staff of all of the government agencies that we work with where we go over all of these funding opportunities. Um, but if any of you would like additional information, I'm happy to set up a meeting. And uh, really, the last thing I want to add is that while I focus today on the programs that we offer to our cities and counties, we also have generous rebates and incentives available to all of our customers to help purchase electric vehicles, 
heat pump water heaters, and HVAC systems. And all of these applications and information about the programs are available on our website, 3cenergy.org. Um, so I hope that I've given you a good picture of what the agency is doing to bring clean energy and community investment to the city of Santa Cruz. We have been so fortunate to have Mayor Keeley and City Manager Huffaker serve on our boards. Santa Cruz has long been an environmental leader, and it is truly a privilege to be your local electricity generation provider to support you and be your partner. So thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Ms. Stedman, thank you very much for being here. As you indicated, I have the privilege of serving on the policy board. Our city manager does serve on sort of the technical board, and uh, he does a very good job there, as he does everywhere else. Uh, but I wanted to uh, comment. the This entity started small and just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, the reason for that is it's voluntary, and counties and cities are understanding as the enterprise continues to mature what the benefits are to the public agency and to the public generally. And I think that watching that expansion every single year, watching that green map of yours get bigger and bigger, is not because people don't understand it, it's because they do understand it. And uh, you know, Dr. Wise West does great work for us in this city on our climate action work. And, uh, and it is integrated into everything we do here. It's one of our core values. And to have the triple CE doing the work it does um, regionally uh, and in our community is another major additive to the overall efforts to deal with climate change and our energy consumption. I don't know that I'm, I'm probably not, the, I've never had an original thought in my life, so I can't imagine it happens now, uh, but it, I've said it before, uh, if we did everything right in the climate change space, but we didn't change the fuel type on how we generate electricity and in transportation, we will fail. Yeah. It'll fail. And uh, so having the energy, the electricity generation, shifting that in the, across the spectrum to green is an incredibly important thing that we can do. Uh, we can do smaller things on fleet issues with regard to electric vehicles and so on, and that's very important. But we can have a real big impact over on the energy side, it seems to me. And so uh, thank you for your fine work. Let me see if my colleagues either have questions or comments on this, on this presentation. Members? Okay. All right. Catherine, please thank all of your colleagues, and uh, we will see you at, uh, at a policy board meeting soon. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We are on item four. This is a mayoral proclamation declaring June 2024 as National Elder Abuse Awareness Month and June 15th, 2024 as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Uh, I am imagining that uh, Gabrielle Barraza is here. Good to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Uh, I have a proclamation here, and I'm going to go down and present it to you. I will not read it, but simply comment that uh, as an elder myself, uh, this notion of elder abuse uh, is maybe coming into focus more as my generation, my friends, my associates get older and older, and you start hearing about these incidents of elder abuse, which I know that it's a terrible embarrassment for many elders to even admit that that's going on in their life because they feel they're losing control of their life or that they've been made a victim and they did something maybe not wise. But we want to get them to, to not feel that way and to bring it out and speak to it. And uh, your work is very helpful in doing that. And thank you so much. I'll bring this down. Please make remarks that you wish to make, sir. On behalf of Adult Protective Services team with the County of Santa Cruz Human Services Department, I would like to thank the City Council and the City of Santa Cruz 
for this proclamation, proclaiming June as Elder Abuse Awareness Month. Our team investigates allegations of abuse, neglect, self-neglect, and exploitation among older and dependents adult adults throughout the county. We strive to reduce the risk of abuse and neglect and enhance safety among all older and dependent adults in Santa Cruz County. The issue of elder abuse is significant, both in impact and scale. According to the National Council on Aging, roughly 10% of Americans over the age of 60 have experienced some form of elder abuse. Various studies estimates that issues of self-neglect adversely affect somewhere between 10 and 21% of American older adults. Upwards of one out of every, or two out of every 10 older adults in our, in our lives may be suffering some form of abuse, neglect, financial exploitation, or inability to meet their own daily needs. To put the scale of this in perspective locally, the population of older adults in Santa Cruz County, age 60 or over, is estimated to reach about 30% of our county's total population by 2030. It is imperative to keep in mind that we estimate that only one in every 24 incidences of elder abuse or abuse against dependent adults is reported. As Mr. Keeley was saying, the shame, the stigma, the lack of uh, independence that people fear uh, is a big impediment into reporting um, raising awareness on this issue of elder abuse will increase attention to this issue, ease fears of seeking help and support, and hopefully will create a community where we can all come together to work towards the elimination of older adult and dependent adult abuse. Thank you. We're on presiding officer announcements. I have none. Statements of disqualification on the rest of our agenda. Do we have any of you made your notations? We'll accept those. Do you have I, others? I have to state it again. Certainly. Uh, so for the record, uh, items, agenda items, 18 downtown association and 19 cooperative retail management. Uh, I will excuse myself as they relate to my employment. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Other members? Seeing and hearing none. We will move on. Additions and deletions. Mr. Attorney, any additions or deletions to the agenda, sir? Ms. Bush, any additions or deletions? Not for me, no. Thank you. City Attorney report on closed session, sir. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. Um, this afternoon was a brief closed session that commenced at 1 p.m. in the Courtyard Conference Room. There were two items on the agenda. The first item was a liability claim. That is the claim of Jose Ruelas. And that is also listed on your consent calendar as item 11 for uh, council action this afternoon. There's also one item of significant exposure to litigation. Council received a report from the City Attorney's Office on that item, and there was no reportable action. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, anything on the calendar you would like to draw to our attention? Um, no changes, but just a reminder, next Tuesday is a study session with the Planning Commission. Thank you. We are on the consent agenda. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with it, we will be taking up items 6 through 17, inclusive on one vote. I will give council members the opportunity to comment on or pull an item or ask a question on the consent agenda. That will be extended also to the public and who are with us in chambers as well as those who may be online. I will start on my right with council member Newsom. Sir, do you have anything on the consent agenda? Council member Brown. I do have comments on uh, item seven, item eight, and item 17. All are brief. Go ahead and I'll make go those. Ahead. Okay, so <clears throat> item seven on our agenda is a motion to adopt a resolution expressing the council support for the Santa Cruz County Water and Wildlife Protection Act, which will be on the ballot, uh, the November ballot. And uh, I just wanted to thank my colleagues. I wanted to thank the city 
for uh, bringing this to um, for allowing the, us to bring this to your uh, to the agenda. Um, you know, I've been talking with some of the uh, sponsors of this uh, act for quite some time now, and one of the things that really struck me as we were having those conversations was the fact that historically, uh, in California, but, but in Santa Cruz in particular, in the county, we have um, invested a lot in conserving lands, um, or, or, yeah, conserving lands. <laughs> but um, we ha we don't. There aren't resources to do the work to manage those lands. And so one of the things that um, was most exciting to me about this was the possibility of a funding source for uh, local organizations, nonprofit organizations like Semper Virens, uh, the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, and others. Um, and I see someone in the audience from Semper Virens. Thank you for being here. Um, <clears throat> who have who have been in this space, working in this space for so long, and see the opportunities and, and the challenges. And I think that this is a measure that will uh, provide significant critical resources to address some of those challenges and create new opportunities. So uh, I wanted to just put that out there before we vote on the consent agenda. Um, on item eight, I wanted to just thank my um, colleague, uh, Council Member Watkins, for bringing this to the agenda. I had seen a call about this as well. Uh, this is to uh, indicate to the governor uh, that in during this year's budget crisis, um, the Santa Cruz, or the, the market match program that the Santa Cruz Farmers Markets use, um, and all safety net programs related to food and nutrition um, should not be cut. So uh, thank you for that. <laughs> um, we need to send these messages to our uh, state leaders to ensure that you know critical services for the most vulnerable are um, not eliminated when we're in times of uh, austerity. <laughs> um, so, and uh, item 17, I just want to thank our public work staff and uh, as well as MBARD staff, the Monterey Bay Air Resources District for, um, this is to, this is a, um, I'll just say this is a, a, a an effort to address um, issues at the landfill and it required some pretty complex uh, navigating and negotiating around the um, the permits. And so I really want to thank you for, I see Kevin out there, um, thank you for your efforts. Um, and here we are. <laughs> so thanks. Thank you, Council Member Watkins. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll associate myself with the comments made by my colleague here, Council Member Brown, certainly on item seven. In addition to um, what was said there on item eight, I will have additional direction I'd like to add when the time comes uh, around how we can make sure that regardless what happens at the state level, and I'll make sure I have language for you, Bonnie, um, that what happens at the state level that we're thinking locally about how we can support our low-income residents being able to access fresh fruits and vegetables. So in hopes that this will change at the state level for many communities beyond ours, um, coming up with a plan to think about what we can do locally is something I'd like to have future direction on. So I'll have language when the time comes. Uh, the time may have come. Okay. Would you like me Why to add that? You, yeah. Let's sure. Go ahead and do that. So when we make the motion to approve consent for item eight, the additional language I'd like to add is that following the adoption of the state budget, to direct staff to return with options for continuing the city's support of the market match program in partnership with the Santa Cruz Farmers Market. Do you need me to read that again, Bonnie? No problem. <laughs> For continuing the city's support of the market match program in partnership with the Santa Cruz Farmers Market. Thank you. Any objection to that? Seeing here, none. We'll add that Thank to you. Thank that you. will be added. Further on the consent agenda? No, that's, that's Very all. Good. Thank Madam you. Vice Mayor. Yes. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Just a brief comment on item seven. Um, Council Member Brown um, articulated it well, but I just want to express my appreciation to my colleagues also for bringing this forward and, and thank the many groups who worked on um, forming of this, and I look forward to um, supporting it out there while the campaign moves on. Thank you, Council Member. 
Councilmember Bruner is recognized on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have comments on agenda item eight and 10, and eight has been expressed, so I echo those comments. Um, thank you so much, and I'm fully in support of that additional language. Uh, let's see, item 10 is the second amendment to graffiti abatement services agreement. And I just want to call out and highlight the great work. Um, this is an item that is funded through many of our departments, the Economic Development Department, Parks and Recs, and Public Works, and Water, and um, the Graffiti Protective Coatings. They respond to all graffiti requests reported through CRISP. Um, the Community Request for Service Portal, as well as other reports of graffiti, and they remove or paint over and matching paint, and they are so quick. Um, I think maybe uh, daily or several times a week um, I use it, so um, just really appreciate that this is um, continuing because it really does make a difference. and. Um, uh, wanted to call that out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. With regard to uh, item number seven, uh, I had the privilege of authoring the two largest park and environmental protection bonds when I had the privilege of serving in the California legislature. One of the constant criticisms of those bond measures was exactly what you have said exactly what you've said, which is, that's great. We're going to get this, we're going to get this, we're going to get this, this is all going to be wonderful, and then we maintain it how? Or we improve it in terms of access for the public how? And the answer at that time was, well, we'll try to do it every year in the budget. And uh, of course, that was a, a promise oftentimes honored in the breach rather than uh, in actual fact. So for our community, uh, this is a, a very important and uh, uh, very important issue that there have been several attempts over the years to try to get this kind of thing to the ballot. And uh, our friends at the, uh, at the Land Trust and our friends at Semper Byron's uh, really leaned into it in a big, big way recently and uh, were able to get the requisite number of signatures. But I think more importantly, we're able to uh, launch their effort in a way that showed how wide and deep the support is for this way to match up with the capital outlay over the years. So uh, thank you for your kind words, and thanks to Semper Byron's and to the Land Trust for bringing this forward. Those are my comments. Are there further comments from the council? This would be the opportunity for anyone to comment upon an item on our consent agenda before we take it up. Anyone wish to do so? Well, Ms. Dan, shockingly, <laughs> welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members and staff. My name is Rachel Dan. I'm the Director of Government Relations for Semper Virons Fund. And I mean, I think you all just did my job for me. And um, so obviously I'm here in support of item seven, uh, also on behalf of the Land Trust. And I just want to thank particularly the Mayor and uh, Council members Brown and Kalantari Johnson for bringing this forward. And, you know, you, like us, believe, um, you know, this is going to be a transformational ballot measure should it pass in November, that for the first time in our county will bring in dedicated funding for climate resilience, um, extreme weather preparedness, and critically to provide a local match for larger state and federal dollars so we can tackle some of those larger projects we have um, right here in our city even. So um, again, I'm here um, to, to thank you all for your, your support, and I am available for any questions, should there be any. Thank you for your service to Santa Cruz. As a former 12-year board member of, the, of Semper Virens, thank you. They're the oldest uh, Redwood Conservation Organization in the United States, founded in 1906, and uh, right literally in our backyard and have been doing great work over the years. Thank you so much. Further on the consent agenda, uh, anyone else wish to testify on any item on the consent agenda, make comment on it? Do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush? No one online, very good, thank you. 
A motion to approve the consent agenda with the additional language as added by Council Member Watkins. The Vice Mayor moves. I'll second. And Council Member Watkins seconds. The clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on the consent agenda public hearing. That would be items 18 and 19. Item 18 is the Downtown Association Parking and Business Improvement Area Assessments for the upcoming fiscal year. Item 19 is Cooperative Retail Management Business Real Property Improvement District Assessments for the upcoming fiscal year. There are no presentations on this item. Let me see if there are members who wish to comment on this. Seeing here none, public hearing is open on both of these items. Anyone who wishes to comment on these, on items 18 and 19. Anyone online, Ms. Bush? Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the body. I'll move. Do some moves. Adoption, Ms. Kalantar Johnson seconds that motion. Bait or discussion, seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Councilmember Bruner has um, recused herself. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. I want to make sure that uh, Councilmember Bruner is aware of what I can do it for you. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. We're on item number 20. This is the first reading of an ordinance to prohibit the use of gas-powered leaf blowers in the city of Santa Cruz. We have a presentation from Dr. Wise West, and uh, we will then take up that item. Dr. Wise West, welcome, and thank you for your good work. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Tiffany Wise West, the Sustainability and Resiliency Officer for the city. And I'm very pleased to share with you today some recommendations from the Health and All Policies City Council Committee um, on a proposed ordinance to prohibit uh, gas-powered leaf blowers. Um, I will review with you what those impacts are. It's um, relatively little known, um, the uh, impact of these. Um, from a climate perspective, especially. We'll talk about community engagement conducted, the key elements of the ordinance itself, and the next steps um, after should uh, council uh, proceed with the ordinance. So just a bit of background on where this originated from. Um, city staff and council members had met um, as early, perhaps even further back than 2021, with community groups, including the Coalition for Healthy and Safe Environments, um, with their concerns over the health and emissions associated with gas-powered leaf blowers. In 2022, we incorporated that into the Climate Action Plan, and as you will see, we have three explicit actions uh, that consider uh, small off-road engines, including gas leaf blowers. Uh, in 2023, the city manager directed staff to begin uh, developing the ordinance. And uh, earlier this year, city council, you all transferred work um, to the Health and All Policies City Council Committee to guide the development of this ordinance from the original ad hoc committee. So. Um, in addition to uh, health and benefits and, and noise mitigation that I'll cover, um, a little bit of background, the Climate Action Plan, which was adopted in 2022, contains three specific actions that are actually modeled into this target that you see on the screen. Um, specifically, uh, T6.5, which is passing a ban on gas-powered small off-road engines, which includes gas leaf blowers. Um, we also committed to exploring ways to mitigate the equity impacts, which I'll share with you today, and uh, to continue to pursue funding, which is also part of the recommended uh, motion today. Um, so in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions themselves, um, it, this, is, this chart shows the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we need to reduce to get to our 2030 target, which is aligned with the state. Uh, uh, measure T6 is that measure uh, that refers to off-road 
engines, and that represents about 7% of our total emission uh, reductions that are needed. We estimate that gas leaf blowers then approximately account for 1% of the total needed emissions reductions. And really, this is a first in a series of other ordinances um, or perhaps voluntary programs that might come forward focused on electrification of landscaping by 2030. Um, so again, uh, gas leaf bores, about 1%. And we've heard folks say, well, why focus on that for just 1%? But one action that gets us 1% is actually not too bad, considering we have 152 actions in our plan. In terms of the regulatory environment, we're really extending from what the state has been going towards. Um, they prohibited the sale of new gas leaf blowers in January of this year. That took effect. Um, the county also, at the end of this month, will be hearing a similar ordinance to regulate gas leaf blowers countywide. And more than 50 municipalities throughout California, including Salinas, Palo Alto, Los, Gal Los Gatos, and Berkeley, have passed similar ordinances that regulate their use. So really important, aside from the emissions piece, are the environmental and public health benefits of uh, gas leaf blowers. Um, we know that they uh, contribute to smog and air pollution, um, not just the emissions, but again, uh, other particulate matters, uh, particulate matter that harms the environment, which can lead to a plethora of health issues, particularly for landscapers, outdoor workers, children, communities of color, and aged individuals, which are the most negatively impacted as cited by a recent CARB study. CARB is the California Air Resources Board, who regulates uh, emissions here in California. And then something we've heard a lot about is the noise levels. Um, so uh, gas leaf blowers can emit up to 155 decibels uh, of noise, whereas ambient urban uh, environment is 60 to 70 decibels. So it, it's quite loud and can be quite disruptive. So what are our, uh, oh, and importantly, this, I think, really drives home how this particular piece of equipment is so important, is that the Air Resources Board has also put out this comparative statistic that one hour of gas leaf blower use is equivalent to driving 1,100 miles in a gas-powered car, which is a bit astounding uh, to think about. So what alternatives are available to us? Well, of course, there's the good old-fashioned rakes and brooms, right? But we also acknowledge that um, with those, there could be some efficiency impacts. And then, of course, there are electric leaf blowers, which range in price from, we've seen them as low as $80 for maybe your backyard patio, up to $2,000 um, for commercial leaf blowers. And there's cost of batteries. We are comparing uh, gas leaf blowers and electric leaf blowers on the table on the right-hand side. Um, I've largely kind of honed in uh, or, or spoke about many of those, but I really want to hone in on the performance piece. Um, this is really the performance um, between gas leaf blowers and electric leaf blowers right now are not necessarily comparable. Gas leaf blowers are more powerful, um, and electric leaf blowers have a rather small battery life. The combination of those two things, when it really matters, is on large properties. When your battery's running out, you have to walk back and get another one and keep going. It really becomes an efficiency issue. And you're going to see this is why we're asking for exemptions at this time for large properties over uh, 10 acres. Um, I've already mentioned uh, the cost, that perhaps there are higher upfront costs. However, lower uh, cost on fuel and maintenance over time. So what's available to mitigate these costs? Well, the Air Resources District has a new program. It's called the Landscape Equipment Exchange Program, or LEAP. It provides up to 80% of the retail price uh, for zero, zero emission landscaping equipment, including gas leaf blowers. And residents are eligible for 2,000 per item and commercial operators up to $15,000. A couple other things uh, about this. So this is a new program. The Air District does indicate that the program is likely to continue uh, through January 2025, which is our recommended implementation date. 
and that it is likely that it will be renewed year to year. However, that is not a guarantee. So I just want to make that clear that there is no guarantee um, that there will be rebates from the Air District. However, um, we have spoken to the Air District, and they are able to accept funds from the city should the city obtain funds and administer them for us for just adding to the city pool. So that's something that we'll be pursuing. Um, also, there are two other uh, potential sources of funding to uh, help in this regard. There, uh, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments is standing up what's called a regional energy network in January of 2025. And we have seen other RENs, as they're called, provide incentives like this, as well as training and some other benefits. So that's coming online. Secondly, we're really interested in leveraging uh, a small grant. We're going to apply to our internal carbon fund. Um, we'd like to address the equity piece by providing trade-ins for at the day labor center here in the county and in our lower income communities uh, or neighborhoods like the beach flats and lower ocean, say at the code enforcement cleanup days. So those are a couple other avenues that um, we are going to be pursuing um, this year. One other thing related to this is that these um, units do need to be recycled properly. They can't just be thrown in the garbage. And our resource recovery facility does indeed accept and dispose of them. And we're exploring adding the facility as an approved drop-off site for the MBAR, the Air District's lead um, program, the uh, LEAP, rather, program. Uh, just to note, there is and has been over the last month about 57,000 available in residential funding and about 261,000 available for commercial funding. That is in the Tri-County area um, as of uh, just a few days ago. So plenty, plenty of, uh, of incentives left. So how did we talk with the community about this? Um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but suffice it to, to say that we, we did pretty extensive outreach, and all of it was bilingual, both in Spanish and English. We have our decarbonization page with a robust frequently asked questions, links to rebates, um, our engagement activities. Um, we also uh, did direct communications with, you can see, a, quite an extensive list of folks from direct mailers to landscapers and large property owners um, to reaching out to the organizations that participate in CORE, for example. So really widespread engagement on this topic, including um, a community survey where we had about 420 people respond and a virtual meeting. So what did folks have to say? And to be clear, this was on the first uh, public review draft of the uh, ordinance. We found that in the survey, uh, more than three quarters of folks supported uh, the proposed ban. However, notably, all surveys that were taken in Spanish opposed the ban. And they cited uh, lack of battery charging space. Um, these are probably small scale folks or, fo or small scale um, uh, landscapers or individuals that maybe don't have space to charge batteries. Um, and of course, the concern about costs. Um, we also heard concerns about the lower power output, which we've discussed, uh, the how that impacts efficiency and the higher upfront costs. In terms of exemptions and enforcement, um, there were advocates that opposed exemptions, um, and they felt that the enforcement details were unclear. Um, in terms of recommendations for implementation, the financial assistance piece, and really a comprehensive education campaign, which is planned, and, and we certainly agree with that. And then lastly, an ample transition period. Uh, originally, October 1st was the um, implementation date, and that has since been moved. So what does this, um, what does this uh, ordinance contain? Um, so these are the key elements here an implementation date of January 1st, 2025, so that would be about six months. Um, the ordinance does have exemptions. Um, we uh, have, have recommended uh, that parcels of 10 acres or more and parcel, large parcels, those over 8.6 acres, or those city parks that are comprised of smaller parcels that together make up a park that's over 8.6 acres, 
are all called out as exemptions. And again, that 10 acres is really that efficiency threshold where it becomes really po problematic um, as, as well as these parks, which again are over 8.6 acres. We did increase the exemption size from five acres originally to 10 acres based on community feedback. We also removed public medians as being exempt, um, really understanding that you know the optics of that probably is not great. And um, I should say that Parks is fully committed to electrifying. They just need a bit of a transition period. They have about a third of their equipment right now um, is electric. In terms of enforcement, uh, the Code Compliance Division of the Planning Department will enforce regulations. Um, they'll submit uh, violations uh, via the CRISP system, the Community Request for Services por uh, Portal. Um, a courtesy notice is sent to owners on the first complaint, and it ends there. They do not get uh, a violation is not issued or uh, evaluated. But subsequent complaints that are verified as violations then are um, treated as a Category 5 offense uh, in their, their scheme of uh, enforcement and could potentially have escalating fines, although there are a range of responses to the violation that are contained in the Municipal Code Title IV, which was one of your attachments. Um, and the responsible party is the property owner. Um, this, uh, these, what we have here addresses many of the comments that have been made um, through our community engagement and that the Health and All Policies Committee daylighted in a couple of their meetings. So our next steps then, um, should today you um, adopt the, the first hearing or approve the first reading, um, we'll go to the second reading on June 25th. Um, we will uh, then develop and execute a comprehensive education and outreach plan. We're very interested in collaborating with the county and they're interested once they pass their ordinance on providing financial assistance and doing this education. Um, we also um, are in talks with Santa Cruz uh, libraries about adding electric leaf blowers to their library of things so people can borrow them to try them, similar to our induction cooktop uh, program that we started last year. Um, we will begin preparing internally for implementation. The Health and All Policies City Council Committee would monitor receiving a one-year evaluation report one year after uh, the implementation date. And we are proposing that we will reevaluate the need for exemptions within three years um, on the next Climate Action Plan's three-year work plan. Um, also, notably, parks um, has agreed that there really is a need for a transition plan for them. And so on their next year's work plan, we are going to address that, not just for gas leaf blowers, but for all their landscaping equipment, because by 2030, we do need to have those electrified. So Parks is going to be developing that transition plan that then will inform this reevaluation of the exemptions. So. Um, really, this is, is not the staff recommendation. It's the Health and All Policies Committee recommendation. But I do uh, have those uh, here in front of you today. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I do also just want to acknowledge uh, our management analyst, Bernie Lazareno, who really had a large role in this um, in developing this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wise-West. Let me ask council members if you have questions of staff at this point. We'll have an opportunity after we hear from the public also, but are there questions at this point? All right, we are going to go out to the public. Those who wish to testify on this item, this would be your opportunity to do so. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? What we're going to do, because we have someone online, is we'll take a person here, then a person online, person here, person online. We'll toggle back and forth. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, hello. I'm so glad that this is moving so quickly because I got to get back to work. Oh, I thought I had three minutes. So this was actually fascinating. You know, I've been in the construction industry for almost 37 years professionally. I don't use water sprayers to clean houses because it causes more damage. And I have a variety of tools that aren't blowing air. They're sucking it in to filter it. So changing the style of... Um, 
petrochemicals to electric doesn't change the toxicity of blowing that material around. So I don't know where some of this material and some of the things that were stated, but I think it was said, I know it was, I wrote it down, that one hour with a leaf blower is the equivalent of driving 1,100 miles in an automobile. I mean, come on. I mean, just because John D. Rockefeller and a bunch of other criminals in 1892 in Geneva met to create scarcity with the second most abundant fuel fluid on the planet, which is oil. Um, and there's just so much information. There's so many differences. I mean, 20 years ago, my friend, a tractor guy, he had a piece of equipment, diesel, three times as efficient as his other one. And that technology was more than 40 years old. It's, they just weren't using it. So what is actually really going on here and what's not being discussed? Now, I did do some research because I was curious. The items that I looked up were between $400 and $1,400 for a residential or commercial leaf blower trimmer. I've heard some wonderful things about the trimmers, but as I said, I would not be blowing stuff around because of the, to of the toxicity. So what else? Anyway, there's just some interesting information about what is actually harmful and not. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We'll take the first person online. Person online, good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Yeah, this is good. Uh, I can't see any timer here. I don't know what's going on with that. But anyway, this item is number 20, gas-powered leaf blower ban ordinance says it's prohibited for any property owner to authorize the operation of a gas-powered leaf blower at any time for any purpose on the property they own. The property owner shall be the party responsible for any violations. I can see problems uh, with the vague word authorized, which maybe ignores fundamental aspects of American law, such as due process, your concept of private property. It's a little strange the person actually holding the smoking gun and performing the actual act of use isn't somehow also in violation and has no parallel responsibility. Perhaps it's another failure of your equity, perhaps. It seems unfair, although, as I said in my letter, I can't wait to call code enforcement on my neighbor who has his landscaper minions gas powered leaf blowing very loudly at 8 a.m. every Monday, going back an eternity, and they even came back today for some more. For an encore. However, I mentioned the state's ex recent existing prohibition on the sale of gas fire leaf blowers will suffice to resolve this issue more fairly eventually without resorting to climate change and catch all justified now now excessive restrictions. Consider carefully that this is precisely like if when Emperor Newsom's premature, unaffordable, and soon to be very unpopular decision to ban the sale of gas powered cars goes into effect in 2035. If you then decided that the authorization of an existing gas-powered car should be an infraction, I will tell you the public would crucify you after a tar and feathering you. Uh, that won't happen in this matter because the political calculation is that this is really just ideological politics and that the offended and the public just don't care about leaf blowing landscapers where they're getting full use of existing equipment uh, and prefer hanging it on their presumed wealthy employers. This is different than every other city that banned it before the state's ban, because they, you know, thought there was no option there. Uh, that you exempt yourself for large parcels is a bit hypocritical, uh, but it's good to be king, huh? Uh, I'm curious what the proposed infraction will be uh, that you're going to stuff in the city's pockets. I'm betting some ridiculously high amount. And if so, uh, I, I don't like giving money to regional authorities. I, I, I Thank think you. you Fines and you are Thank to you. buy and then dispose of those. Thank you. Companies. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Hello. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. My name is Ken Foster. I'm a landscape contractor and I'm the owner of Terra Nova Ecological Landscaping. And I'm the founder of this organization. You may have seen our signs around town. Uh, it, originally, it was the Leaf Blower Pollution Task Force that became Chase. Um, in 2015, I did a broom versus a leaf blower challenge, and we had four judges, one judge with a decibel meter judging for noise pollution, one judge with a nose judging for air pollution, one judge with a camera judging for thoroughness, and one judge with a stopwatch. And we had a 100-foot walkway with the same exact amount of debris, and on my broom, I won for air pollution and for noise pollution. And on a scale of one to 10, we, my 
my challenger who had a backpack gas blower. We both came in at six for thoroughness and I lost by 14 seconds in speed. The next day, the Sentinel headline was, the broom sweeps the competition. <laughs> so we, we've been calling for a leaf blower ban, gas blower ban for all these years, since before 2015. This is high time. We really need this. And I also say that we need um, to re get rid of the exemption for 10 acres. I don't believe that's necessary. But um, thank you very much for having this ordinance up here. Thank you very much. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Good afternoon, welcome. I'm Carol Wilhelmy. Gas-powered leaf blowers are not just a minor annoyance or source of pollution. The benzene, 1,3 butadiene, formaldehyde and acetaldehyde emissions spewed by two-stroke engines are toxic and carcinogenic, contributing to asthma, heart disease, compromised immune systems, and several kinds of cancer. <coughs> the noise negatively impacts our health as well. Gas blowers are an obsolete technology that should have been banned years ago. The Santa Cruz Coalition for a Healthy and Safe Environment has been asking the Santa Cruz City Council to ban the use of this equipment for years. We thank Council Member Kalantari Johnson for sponsoring this ordinance, and we urge the Council to pass it. However, we are concerned about the 10-plus acre parcel exemptions, which were supposed to give city parks and schools more time to transition to cleaner tools. Is that equitable? How about the health and quality of life of residents who live in large mobile homes, parks, and homeowners associations? Santa Cruz County businesses and residents can get new battery equipment for 80% off through MBARD's LEAP program. Battery equipment not only protects the health of the tool operators, it enables businesses to save on fuel and tool maintenance costs. Businesses can recognize a positive return on investment within a short period of time. I have hundreds of signatures and dozens of letters here written to city council over the years by Santa Cruzans who demand a ban, and I will provide, provide these to you. 76% uh, of respondents recently polled by city staff support a strong and enforceable ordinance. And thanks again to Councilmember Carlin Tari Johnson and the Health and All Policy Committee. Thank you so much. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Very good. Good afternoon, welcome. Thank you. My name is Ron Goodman, just speaking on behalf of myself. Um, I support the, the ordinance. Um, I want to add one other benefit for the climate. Um, a lot of people I know, including myself, work from home. But on days when I have important meetings, I can't work from home. So a lot of people drive into an office because you know that there's going to be leaf blowers outside your window. So another positive benefit to add to the, to the ban. Um, I, do you think that it would be good to include city parks? To me, it seems a little problematic that the city parks are exempted. I know that it's in the plan for next year, but to me, it would be even better if we asked, since we're asking landscapers to make this shift, I think we should ask the city parks to do it quickly as well. Um, I'd love to see um, it extended to all gas-powered um, power tools. And then the last comment I have about the 10-acre parcels, just. I don't know if this is maybe a subtle change that might need to be written. It seems like this differentiation of like a um, uh, an open space that's 10 acres, definitely problematic versus a mobile home park where you can actually bring your landscaping vehicle around might not make sense to have that same restriction. But I live in a, um, a homeowners association that has a 10 acre parcel as well as a bunch of smaller parcels. I think the ordinance is written clearly that it applies to the 10 acre parcel, but not to the individual smaller parcels. But it's confusing. I've actually seen some things that specifically say our homeowners ex uh, uh, association is exempted, but we're, we're not and we shouldn't be just the one big parcel. Um, so just a little bit of weirdness about the language there that might benefit from cleanup. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. 
Thank you. I'm Brett Garrett. I live here in downtown Santa Cruz. Um, and I want to thank you for bringing this item forward. I think we've all had the unpleasant experience of walking by someone who's using a leaf blower, and very often they will pause their work while I walk by, which I always appreciate so much. And most especially, I appreciate that I'm not the person with the leaf blower. I, I just, it just seems like such an unpleasant, toxic um, job using a gas-powered leaf blower. Blowing, I mean, I cannot breathe when I'm walking by someone using it. So how can that person breathe that is doing the work? These devices are a serious threat to those workers' health and hearing. The exhaust contains carcinogens, including benzene and formaldehyde, and also ultrafine particles, which the workers are inhaling deep into their lungs because they are working, exercising, while they're using the leaf blower. Um, I'm looking at a 2017 article from Salon that says emissions from leaf blowers and other off-road engines in 2016 were 81% as high as the amount from standard sedans. And the leaf blowers create ultrafine particles at 40 to 50 times the level of a clogged intersection at rush hour. Um, Gas-powered leaf blowers are very dangerous, especially for the workers. I really don't like any leaf blowers, but uh, gas-powered ones are pretty obviously the worst. Um, I think of the irony of using this device to make the neighborhood or the area prettier, but while you're doing the work, it kind of makes the area unbearable. It's, it's, it's kind of this weird thing of making a place really ugly for a little while in order to make it pretty. I don't know. Um, so. Yeah, so thank you. I don't like leaf blowers. Please support this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you very much. My name is Susan Kaufman. I've been a city resident for most of my life. I'm a retired city and county land use planner, and I support the draft leaf blower ordinance as a step in the right direction. I would like it to go farther in the future. Um, and I am also asking for the removal of the exemption. So I want to start by saying, if you've ever been ill, which we all have been ill, we realize that our, how, our health is number one. And in order to stay healthy, we have to have a healthy environment. For that reason, I advocate for a complete ban on leaf blowers, gas, and um, battery powered however, and also gas-powered uh, landscape equipment. Um, and the reasons that I would la like to ask for a ban on these leaf blowers is because, number one, we need to change the way that we look at leaves. <laughs> um, leaves are not trash. They're not garbage. <laughs> They're natural organic material that's essential as mulch for keeping our dry, dry soils um, moist, and they're essential for reducing weeds and replenishing the health of the soil. So we don't need to necessarily get rid of all leaves to make everything beautiful because leaves are as natural as trees and plants. Number two, leaf blowers are unnecessary. I'm old enough to know <laughs> that before we had these hazardous tools, these leaf blowers, we used to do just fine. Everything wasn't filthy back there, back then with leaves. Um, and um, lastly, I wanna say that um, leaf blowers create horrible pollution, noise pollution and air pollution. And please remove the 10 acre exemption specifically in mobile home parks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? No. Anyone else? Last call. Wish to testify on this item. Public hearing closed. We are back before the body. Ms. Kantar Johnson is recognized. I do have a follow-up question before the motion. I, please okay. proceed. Um, just to the, the point that was made around homeowners association exemption, um, I wonder if Dr. Wise West, you or anyone else could speak to that. I cannot speak to that. Um, I know that our uh, city attorney, uh, Sam Humia, is here who has looked at how we can disaggregate um, some of the 
uh, property types, um, it, and it it's not so easy to pull out HOAs specifically. But um, I don't know if Sam, you have anything you might want to add to that. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, Council. My name is Sam Hume, and I'm a Deputy City Attorney. Um, I want to actually ask a clarifying question about your question, which <laughs> is uh, for the HOA uh, exemption. Uh, what exactly are you concerned with? I think what I heard was that currently HOAs, I don't know if I heard this right, the HOAs are um, exempt from the, yeah. I think the question is that um, some HOAs are contiguous one property that's 10 acres, and so they would be exempt. But I also heard that some are comprised of smaller, smaller. acreage that in some could add to 10 acres, similar to our park situation. So, so I think that's the question is, is, are those smaller parcels exempt? They are not. They are not exempt. They are not exempt. That's oh. correct. OK. OK. Thank you. That clarifies it. Uh, and and sorry. Um, so if, if it's confusing, I just wonder if there's any way we can clean up that language so that it's not confusing. Sure. I was. I actually made a note that this is something we'll add to the frequently asked questions. Okay. Um, it actually had not come to my attention until this morning receiving a um, uh, an email message about that. So, um, but adding to the frequently asked questions, we can do that. Um, I'm not sure in the ordinance itself um, how the language might be changed. The ordinance itself does not actually exclude HOAs or mention HOAs. I think the complication comes from the uh, tendency of some HOAs to aggregate their, their land ownership. But uh, if we wanted to specifically account for HOAs in our ordinance, we could certainly go back and uh, add language to that effect. If I may add, so we have the same case with our parks, right? That where there are smaller parcels, but together they are exceed 10 acres. Um, and how we address that is we simply called them out in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, so it, there's not necessarily, I don't think we're going to call out all the HOAs. That doesn't make sense, right? Um, I don't know if maybe um, the assistant uh, director of planning, Eric Marlette, might have any suggestions. I think he is here. Any suggestions on how let, we might Let, do let that? me do this. Yes. Um, uh, let's get the questions asked. Uh, we'll get to doing wordsmith in a minute. Do you have other questions on this? No, I'm ready to make a motion when okay, uh, my colleagues that. are. Please proceed. With my motion? Yes. OK. Um, so I would like to make a motion to um, introduce for publication an ordinance entitled Prohibition of Gas-Powered Leaf Blowers to add chapters 6.110-6.110.070 to Title VI. Health and, can I just say, I, I, I'd like to make a motion to um, approve item one as recommended in the staff report. Um, item two as recommended in the staff report. And um, I'm going to propose a change for item three. And that is to, um, I haven't sent this to you, Bonnie, but I'll say it slowly, um, phase out acreage exemption within two to three years of implementation of the ordinance. I'll second the motion. There's a motion and a second uh, on that. Please open on your motion. OK, great. Um, well, I just I want to first thank um, Dr. Tiffany Wise West and Bernie and my council um, colleagues on the health and all policies. Um, I didn't know much about gas powered leaf blowers other than they're annoying when I hear them in the neighborhood. Um, and when members of Chase, Carol and, and Chris reached out to me several years ago now, I think I was like day two um, as a council member. Um, and they shared a wealth of information that they had gathered over the years, I was really quite surprised about uh, the health impacts that we um, just saw a little bit of in the presentation that was made. Um, so that caught my attention, and um, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to pursue this ordinance. Also because, as was presented, um, aligns with the direction of the state and state law, aligns with what we've committed to as a community in our climate action plan, 
Um, so I think this is the right time. It's been a year since, no, it's been six months or so since the state law has gone into effect. And by the time, if this ordinance passes by the time we implement, it will have been a year since the state law has gone into effect. So I think the timing is right. Um, I think there is community readiness. Clearly we've seen a lot of support here today and prior to that through the letters. I do want to take a moment and acknowledge um, the Coalition for Safe and Healthy Environment. Mm -hmm. It sounds like about at least a decade of work that's gone into this and so much rich information that's been gathered. So I want to acknowledge the Coalition for their advocacy. Um, and I, I may have additional changes around that HOA piece um, once we get some clarity. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you. For the debate or discussion, Councilmember Watkins. I, um, I don't have any additions or changes, but I do just want to thank all of the staff time that was uh, spent on this. I know this was ongoing in terms of what was brought up for the years that has kind of led to this this day where we're having a first reading in terms of uh, past council members. I know Council Member Myers worked on it uh, for a while. And so I, um, I just appreciate it being before us. I think what was clear to me is that this is not perfect, but we did the best we could to strike a balance to do something in the right direction for Santa Cruz. Um, and I just also want to end by thanking Councilmember Kalantari Johnson for her work and just really diving into the details and trying to craft something that can work here in Santa Cruz. So um, happy to have further discussion based on on the input from my colleagues, but wanted to acknowledge all the all the time, effort, and energy from our community, from our staff, and from our council to to bring us to this place today. Thank you. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to, uh, a little bit of what I say is going to be repetitive, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, f first, I'll say I, I want to thank my colleagues and uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson in particular for really taking this up and rolling up your sleeves. Um, this is something that I have been uh, supportive of during my time on the council. I have also kind of worked on it in fits and starts with a variety of council members over the years and we never quite got there. So I'm, I'm really glad to see that we're going to make some progress here. Um, I've, I've been a long time opponent of the gas powered leaf blowers because of the environmental and public health effects. Um, they are annoying. Lots of noises are um, challenging to deal with in our urban environments. Um, but this one really feels like the impact is so significant that it is something that we, sh we should be working on. And um, it's long overdue. I will, uh, I want to say that um, the, the community group, Chase, you are um, the, you really are the quintessential tenacious and patient <laughs> community organization uh, because I spoke with you and I have my, I brought my packet here where I'm organizing some files and I, I found this from 2019 and I know we had been talking even earlier um, and, you know, and, and the, some of the signers on the, the documents are, are here today and I really appreciate you for hanging in there and, um, and bringing us to this point. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, and Bernie for your efforts here. I know that it's, um, there, there are levels of complexity to this and there are um, consequent, there will be consequences. So there, we will experience, you know, some people will experience uh, challenges related to this and those small landscaping uh, businesses, uh, you know, are, are of the most concern to me as a representative of the city to the Monterey Bay Air Resources District, I've advocated strongly for using those, um, the, the funding that we're receiving to help support um, folks who are um, are needing that support. And I'm, I'm really glad it's happening. I, I hope that, um, I know you've been doing a tremendous amount of outreach and the, the packet includes, um, you know, a lot of community meetings that you've had and, and outreach that you've done, um, but trying to make sure that people who will struggle with this transition ha know about those rebates. And, um, and I fully support the city doing whatever we can to identify resources, both for our own uh, fleet of leaf blowers and you know, equipment and for um, for the community at large. So um, I'll just, 
I, I want to I want to read something here because I did I went back through the packet and I was looking um, at at the um, some of the arguments that were made and I think they're as relevant today as they were then um, that and you wrote um, Ken and and uh, Carolyn and others um, or Carol excuse me. In many ways, the leaf blower issue mirrors environmental and public safety issues of the past. At one time, it was vigorously argued that eliminating the most toxic agricultural pesticides, for example, DDT, would put farmers out of business. Secondhand smoke was considered a mere nuisance to the hypersensitive. Um, fuel efficiency standards would spell the death of the American <coughs> automotive industry. And I'll, I'll leave it there and just say what we, we know that um, that's not been the case and that the, um, that the market catches up sometimes with the regulatory environment and I believe it will in this case. So um, just wanted to say that I'm very much supportive um, and as I conclude, do want to follow up on the, the question related to homeowners associations, mobile home parks, I, as I understand it, the issue is that those are, um, because we're looking at parcels, that those parcels can be larger than 10 a acres for a, a park um, or some kind of planned development. And that, um, as a result, they're, they fall into that exemption category. And so I'm just wondering if it's possible to look at those parcels where there are multiple multiple residences, or I don't know what the language would be, to make it clear that they are also included. Um, so hopefully we can find a way to get there. Um, to, I agree that it is, um, it's problematic uh, that we are looking at an exemption for uh, our own operations, and, um, and I, you know, I feel that. <laughs> um, but I also think that we need to do what we can at this point in time, recognizing that our city staff are going to be working um, to achieve that commitment uh, for our, ourselves as well. And then lastly, I would ask that when whatever reports are going to be developed about how this to let the council know how this is going or the Health and All Policies Committee, um, I think it would be helpful to track the because this is going to be a complaint driven enforcement model um, and we know that some people are going to be more likely to complain than others um, you know I mean I know people who are like ready to get into that CRISPR system and start doing it tomorrow right um, but that it will be unevenly um, kind of enforced right be due to the complaint based nature and so I think it would be helpful to see where the complaints are coming from what parts of town are affected and relatedly you know kind of who is um, I know that the property owners will be held responsible, but um, to the extent that there is a landscaping company or a contractor, um, if it's them or if it's the owner themselves, um, just whatever information can be captured there to really better understand how it's um, working would be really helpful. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Bruner is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Thank you, Councilmember Brown, for your previous work on this. And um, I will just repeat uh, working with the Health and All Policies Committee and Councilmember Kalantari Johnson um, and city staff who put in hours of back and forth changes as we worked through balancing really a lot of the input we received over 400 surveys and in-person meetings and emails. And um, I think that we've gotten to a point where um, I absolutely support the exemptions with this phased out period in order to balance a transition period. Um, it was a lot to uh, consider. And I just want to call out the um, environmental and public health impacts, especially for the users. It was really our focus uh, moving forward and for those around as well. And that it was a priority that we include funding, rebates, and grants as part of part of it, including the solutions with the ordinance. And so um, um, as, as um, uh, a Health and All Policies Committee member, um, thank you for everyone for um, working as 
as a village, so to speak, to get to this point and um, for us to align with, you know, the new state law that now bans the sale of gas-powered leaf blowers. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if um, staff can share potential language that makes explicit that HOAs are not exempt. And if and if you have that, we could consider adding it. I've provided that to the city clerk. Okay. And council member, this, this would be a proposed a Amend additional amendment to your motion, correct? Correct. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that provides the clarity that we need. So is there, um, so the fourth part of my motion would be to make these proposed amendments to the ordinance? No, not needed. It's the motion already. would be just to introduce with this language uh, added. Okay. So the first part of your motion covers it. Covers it. Okay. Agreeable to the second. Agreeable. So, so, so added to the uh, motion. Uh, anyone else on this item? Uh, let me move through a couple of issues. First of all, I think the case statement is great. I, I don't think that's a debatable point. I think the, what the problems are with gas-powered leaf blowers is uh, legendary. I've been around a long time. Uh, I'll tell you how long. I remember you should be afraid of any sentence that begins with when I was in the legislature. So <laughs> when I was in the legislature, uh, I remember that, uh, so that this would have been around 1998. And at that time, a coastal member introduced a bill to ban leaf, excuse me, gas-powered leaf blowers. That ran into a lot of opposition at the time from an interesting quarter. And the Latino caucus universally opposed it because at that time, there were not alternatives of a mechanical nature. The alternatives were brooms and rakes. And uh, one of the statements that they repeatedly made on the floor in opposition to the bill at that time was that the leaf blowers were the sounds of work. And for their members and their constituency, that was a very important issue. And their issue was don't ban this piece of equipment until there is a viable alternative. Here we are now quite a bit later and the alternatives are here. And I think that's the good news, is that the case statement has been there for decades. The question is whether or not there's uh, viable alternatives that, that can be used. And I think that we are now in the front end of that space. Uh, when I had an opportunity to go over to the uh, uh, Parks and Recreation's Corp Yard over at RV West, they showed the difference between the kinds of leaf blowers, the gas powered and the electric, and went through an entire demonstration. Uh, I am not a big fan of the, uh, of the exemptions. I think they made a good case, and I think that what the council member and what I've heard council member Newsom talk about with regard to some kind of a two or three year sunset on that so we can revisit that question about exam. I think that's a very thoughtful way to do it. Let me go to the two issues that maybe they haven't been raised. Uh, one has been touched on but not raised. Uh, and that is the financial impacts and incentives. It seems to me that the architecture of our ordinance here says we're going faster than the state. The state has said you can't buy one. We're saying you can't use one. And I think that that's, that's who we are. That's a, that's a good thing for us to do that. When we say that, though, the ordinance is replete with references to how, and this item is replete with references to how we will attempt to reduce the sting on those folks who uh, are going to have to replace the equipment. I think that it's not too big a leap to say that what that's really directed at is it's directed at uh, many of the uh, two folks with a pickup truck uh, landscapers. Uh, I, I happen to, to 
employ uh, one of those on Friday mornings at my house, and so do a lot of other people around, obviously. Um, and I think that that's a very important thing for us to do. A lot of these landscapers, obviously, are not living high on the hog, or somehow they're, you know, they're working hard every day. And this is a capital cost for them that, that in some cases is, is a burden, in other cases it isn't. I think this idea of funding is a, is a critical part since we are accelerating the pace of this transition from gas to electricity. So my question then becomes, I don't believe the ordinance says that uh, there will be a subsidy or that there will be a buyout. I think that that's aspirational on our part, but I don't think it contains anything that assures that that's the case. Am I right on that? Correct. Yeah, okay. So this idea that we could go to the Air Board and ask them for something, or CARB or anybody else, or the Monterey Bay Unified Air Pollution Control District, any of these entities, those are all we hope they would look favorably on our requests, right? There's, no, there's nothing that, when this ordinance goes into effect, we have no guarantee that there will be a source of funding. Is that correct? There are no guarantees, but just to make clear, there, are, there is a source of funding right now that's expected to last to un, through our implementation period, and the Air District expects to renew that but cannot make any guarantees. Okay. So, and that funding source, the origin of that funding source is what? It's the Carl Moore Air Program from the state. Right. And which, the source of that money is? Uh, state funding that, that is uh, appropriated and um, to anticipate your question. Do you know if the Carl Moyer program f was funded at the same level in the governor's proposed budget and the May revise as it was last year? I don't know the answer to that question. I can follow up on that. The, uh, I think that's a major issue. And I think we need to, uh, to deal with that in the ordinance, because not to have that in the ordinance is to say that we are going to put a financial burden on folks that we allege week in and week out that we care deeply about. Let me go to the other issue, and I think that's the responsible party. I have a lot of problem with this. Um, if someone drives a pickup truck, I hire someone to... Uh, paint my house and they drive their pickup truck onto my property and it hasn't been smogged. It's in violation of the smog laws. Um, DMV doesn't come after me as the homeowner. They go after the person with the, drove, with the truck. And I think I could go on and on with examples. I think this is very misplaced, the responsible party. The responsible party is the person who's breaking the law. The person breaking the law is the person using the gas-powered leaf blower. And I think that that's where we need to, uh, I am uninterested, so that we're very clear about this, I am completely uninterested in ease of administration in this case. It's of no interest to me. The fundamental here is if somebody's using a gas powered, a gas powered leaf blower, that's against the law and that's the person who should be cited and that's the person who should be punished if they continue to use that not somebody else, not some second party or third party. So these are two issues that I would hope that we could address in a meaningful way before this, op this uh, ordinance is adopted in its final form. Again, because this is exactly the right thing to do. It's been decades coming, and now we're there. We've, we're very close. We've got most of the equipment, most of the power issues, most of these issues have been resolved. They're probably going to be two or three more years before the industry catches up with the electric blowers that are as efficient and effective as the others. And I think Public Works will be glad to tell you that. That's what they believe as well. So uh, let me begin this part by asking if either, I'll wait for a moment. Sam, would you come up? Thank you. Certainly. Given what my concern is, uh, let's take these in order. The financial impacts incentive. Is there a way to write into the ordinance that the ordinance will be effective so long as there is a funding source for replacement or for some period of two years or so to give people the opportunity to do that? 
It is certainly legally possible to do that, okay. to write that in. Would you be kind enough to uh, draft such an amendment that we could consider when we take this up on second reading? Certainly. Thank you. With regard to the responsible party, I'm also interested in that. I, I, you can see what I want to do. I want to, I want to get to the actual responsible party. It's the person using the leaf blower from my point of view. I understand that's a more difficult thing perhaps. Somebody would rather call and say, well, somebody's using it over at this address rather than saying ABC Landscaping is doing it. I don't know if it's harder or easier, I don't know. But shifting the point of the, uh, uh, the person who we're holding accountable to the person using, meaning the person who uses the gas-powered leaf blower, you draft an amendment on that? I certainly could. On, on that point, I want to make one second you point, see. which is that uh, even without shifting and uh, placing it on the person that actually utilizes the leaf blower, um, the holding the property owner accountable both civilly and criminally is still above board. Is still what? It's still uh, possible. Yeah. Oh, I understand that. Yeah, I didn't think it wasn't possible. I just don't think it's appropriate. <laughs> Those are different so. issues. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, so, Ms. Contar Johnson, uh, as the maker of the motion, I would like to engage you in a colloquy because these are substantive, uh, and I'm wondering what you think. Why don't we take these separately, take up the financial impacts issue first? I, I hear your concerns, Mayor. Um, my concern is that then we would not be able to implement the ordinance that we've been working so hard and long and the community has been waiting for um, if we put that type of a language in there. I would be interested in um, directing staff to explore alternatives if those state funds are exhausted. Um, and I don't know if that would meet your concerns, but again, I hear the concerns. But my concern is we wouldn't be able to implement if we have that type of a language. Well, we wouldn't be able to, to uh, do it if the funding wasn't there. Well, what I will say is that um, from having engaged in this for a while now, yeah. um, the funding has been there. It's been underutilized, and I think partially because there hasn't really been a need for um, landscapers at this point. There hasn't been that extra nudge for folks to use it. Um, if I could add, oh, please, go no, ahead. I didn't just, mean to interrupt you. No, no, I, I, I hear the concerns about the state cuts, um, but I feel that we have time right now before implementation. That's why, that's one of the reasons why we pushed it, because mm -hmm. originally I think we wanted to implement in October and we pushed it a few months out. Um, I believe we have time to engage our local landscapers, work with the county to engage our local landscapers. Um, if my understanding is, is accurate, um, the smaller equipment is as low as 80 to $100. It's the larger equipment, the commercial equipment, that's up to $2,000. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to make assumptions, but those businesses that are um, using these equipments for commercial spaces maybe have more resources than the smaller mom and pops. Right. So, um, okay. yeah. Uh, if, if I, as I recall, Ms. Brown, you are our representative for the Air District. Is that correct? Yes. In the, if I might engage you in a colloquy on this, the uh, is the Air District. Uh, uh, when does it make decisions? Is this a, a part of your annual budget considerations, or when do you make this kind of of decision? So the the budgeting is we do make that decision at budget time. However, we also make adjustments to programs, or when new funding comes online, we will adopt guidelines around those at different times of the year. Um, but I will say that I, I'm trying to find out if the Carl Moyer Fund got, is getting cut in this <laughs> this year's budget and the, the May revise. But I will say that there's a commitment at the, okay. at the Monterey Bay Air Resources District to continue to do this. And in fact, um, we may get other funds from other parts of the state that are not using that funding. Right. So there's an expectation, but not a guarantee that we will have funds for the, at least the near term. When the Air District does make an appropriation in your budget, and I'm assuming your budget's either adopted or close to being adopted for the new fiscal year, uh, so uh, I would be interested in knowing if there's anything in that, 
in your adopted budget for the new year that would provide us directly provide assistance on this. Um, when the air, I, I yes, can, please, I can just say please. that that um, where we're at is that the there is funding in the budget and it will be available until it's spent, and then next year we'll adopt a budget that may or may not have more funds, but or and may have funds from other parts of the state that are left over. So there's an again expectation. But and when you say this year and next year, you mean fiscal years that start on July first? Yes. Okay. So. Are you telling us that the air district on the budget that begins on July 1st contains Carl Moyer funds that you could use for this purpose? Yes. Do you know how much that is by any chance? Tiffany, do you know how much it is? Um, I can find out, but it's, it's, uh, it's. I think they started with 300,000 in total. Yeah. yeah. So if they repeat, it would be another 300,000. Are there so, other. Uh, somewhere under that, but not very, very far under that. <laughs> In terms of trying to discern what the claims on that fund might be, are there other jurisdictions within the Air District that uh, are moving to prohibit gas-powered leaf blowers so there would be increased pressure to use those funds? We know Salinas already has. We know Salinas already has, and the county is. Those are the only ones that we're aware of. We did contact the other cities in Santa Cruz County that are not pursuing Watsonville or uh, Capitola or Scotts Valley are not pursuing right now. And are you a three county air district? <laughs> we Santa, are. Santa Cruz, Monterey, San Benito? Yes, we are. Do we know anything about those two other counties and the cities they're in? No, we don't. Yeah. We don't know what directions well, they're taking. I can tell you that the representatives from the various local government jurisdictions in those counties have not stated that they're doing this and um, in the affirmative, um, it hasn't been a question that's been asked, but I do not get the impression that it's something they're pursuing right now. Okay, so I'm getting to the conclusion that you think it's reasonable that the Air District has appropriations in it. Other jurisdictions, there might be a couple, but it's not every one of them, that there's a reasonable likelihood that this will fund the demand side of this ordinance when it goes into effect. I do, uh, and uh, I'll say just as an aside, um, we get <laughs> we get a, we get a lot of attention <laughs> as the city of Santa Cruz because we um, we actually <laughs> represent a larger share of survey respondents and um, grant recipients uh, for a variety of MBARD programs. So and and others take note of that. Um, and I say, well, get out there and <laughs> get your jurisdiction to be more proactive. So um, I, I do feel confident. My, my major concern is just the, the connection for people who, who aren't familiar with these kinds of programs and may not have access to that information, uh, knowing it's there. That's m mostly the concern, more than availability of funds. Let me go to the responsible party question and uh, engage the maker of the motion in that. You heard, I'm not going to repeat it all. I think you need to go after the person who's breaking the law, not some other party. I wonder what your thoughts on that might be. Well, my thoughts are that I'm the person who is hiring a service. And um, so, it, so, Logically, in my mind, the way that it's written does make sense. Now, let's just put that aside. This enforcement piece was a difficult piece to tackle. Um, we did a lot of deep dives. We did a lot of research to see how other communities are doing it. And no other community, please correct me if I'm wrong, no other community that, is, is holding, is that? That's not correct. That's not the correct. majority of communities have the um, property owners of responsible party. Well, that's what I was getting to. Yeah, no other not 100%. No other right. Oh, oh, the majority. The majority. Okay. So the, I'm incorrect in that. Um, I thought it was no other community was holding right. the um, landscaper responsible. So I'm incorrect in that. But the majority are hold the property owner responsible. Um, so in my mind, it makes sense that we do it that way. I would have questions about how it would be how it would be enforced. Um, I hear what you're saying about the administrative piece is not of concern. I, I hear that. And if we aren't able to enforce it, then the ordinance is, once again, it's a mute point. 
and we've done all this work for nothing. So I, I would be curious to hear if we were to shift to putting the onus um, on the landscapers, logistically, what would that look like? How would we enforce it? So. Well, I think we have that problem on a whole range of public policy issues. So you can't use lead-based paint, but if a painter comes over and uses lead-based paint on your house, uh, the remedy is the painter. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of instances in the law in which it's the person who did the act. Uh, there are other parts of the law where it's the person who hired the service. So I think it's a fair issue about where do we lay this. So I, sure. And, and to me, so let me just run through this. I mean, is, is the imagination goes wild here. Uh, somebody is walking down the street, they see at their neighbor's house, uh, landscapers there using a gas-powered leaf blower. They then file a complaint with the city uh, saying, I saw somebody at whatever this address is using a gas-powered leaf blower. Now comes the question, does that person get to defend themselves? Do they get to say, no, I'm sorry, I didn't have somebody doing that? Uh, do they get to say, uh, you know, where's the proof here? Where's the, who are you, who are you going after here? Um, a property owner said, I wasn't home. I don't know about that. I mean, yeah, I have a landscaper. I don't know what kind of equipment. How do you know the person who complains? How do you know it was a gas-powered leaf blower as opposed to an electric leaf blower? You know, it, it seems to me this is way off the point of getting the person who's using the leaf blower. I don't know that it's any harder to find out the the name on the side of the pickup truck or the landscaping firm that it is to track down the, the homeowner. Probably easier to track down the homeowner, I understand that, but ease of administration doesn't interest me. And it's where do we lay the responsibility for using the equipment correctly? And uh, I, I, I think reasonable people, you're a reasonable person, I've prefer to think I am. Uh, so obviously some jurisdictions are coming down on one side, mostly one side, the side you're arguing for, mm -hmm. but others are coming down on the other side. And I think that this is uh, uh, an important enforcement question. We're legislating here. And uh, I think we want to get the, leg the law right. And I guess I, not I guess, I know that I don't favor laws that swing at one person who's doing something illegal and hits somebody else. So uh, I don't have any trouble with enforcement. It's who are we enforcing this on? The user of the equipment or some other party through some theory that they, uh, they are bringing this person or hiring this person, whatever it is. I get that. It's not that I fail to understand it. It's I disagree with it. May or may I? Oh, but of course you should. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't let that comment go unanswered. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just have a, a, an example that comes to mind of when we do do this, and I, and I comes to mind because I worked on it prior to becoming a council member, and that's our party ordinance. Uh -huh. So um, when there's underage drinking happening at a home, we hold the homeowner or home, the person who is renting to the young people responsible. So we do quite a bit of outreach and education. We're used to, I don't know how the ordinance is being used these days. Um, and we educate those who are renting to students and we educate that if there's a loud and unruly party and underage drinking, they will get a fine of $200. If there's another one, they will get a fine of $500. If there's another one, it goes up incrementally. There is an opportunity for that homeowner to um, then come back. I, actually, the first first is a warning, as is the case that we're proposing with this enforcement um, framework. First is a warning, and then it's the it goes up. So I, I believe that that between the warning and the first citation, whatever amount that is, there's an opportunity to engage with that homeowner and with the party that is breaking the law. So that's that's the example that comes to mind. Um, different issue, but similarly in the framework. Oh, understood, understood. All right, further on this item. Clerk will call the roll. Council member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are moving to item 21. This is the adoption of the fiscal year budget. Uh, we will have a staff presentation on this. 
And there are two features. One is the major uh, item on the budget. The other is uh, certain actions that we need to take of a personnel nature. To align that, let me see if the... Uh, Good afternoon. Nice to see you. I understand Ms. Cabell is out of town on a very long-standing commitment. Much needed. Vacation. And although we miss her dearly, we are happy to see you. Thank you for all your fine work and your colleagues. Thank you and them for their very fine work on a compound complex topic. And we are waiting for what? Are we waiting for me? <laughs> okay. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Tracy Cole, and I'm the Budget Manager in the Finance Department. We're here today to adopt the fiscal year 2025 budget. Two years ago, sorry. Ms. Cole, let me ask you to do one other thing. Move that microphone really close because you have a soft voice. So I'm going to make sure everybody, this is budget. I've got to make sure we hear every word of this. Okay. Thank you. Good enough, yeah. Okay. Um, so we're here today to adopt the fiscal year 2025 budget. Two weeks ago, on May 28th, we all met and discussed the fiscal year 2025 proposed budget. We had a lively discussion, many questions were asked, and several changes were requested by council. You have all received a memo from our finance director, Elizabeth Cabell, outlining these requested changes and actions. The next two slides summarize these actions so council and the public can see the changes. So this first slide summarizes the items that um, were requested by council and that have been completed and added to the budget. We have added requested goals to several departments as well as clarifying the department overseeing the work of the Child and Youth Bill of Rights in Youth Liaison. We added additional funding for children's fund reporting and funding for tenant assistance and eviction prevention. And we have provided fund balance estimates for enterprise funds. This next slide summarizes the ongoing requests that will be addressed at a later date. These include reviewing habitually vacant positions, public safety impact fees exemption, the Pogonet Clubhouse, and funding for fire apparatus. So here we are. This is the end of my presentation. So the recommended actions for today are from item 21.1, to adopt the budget in the, uh, of the City of Santa Cruz for fiscal year 2025, including the capital investment program as proposed in the document entitled City of Santa Cruz Annual Budget Fiscal Year 2025. Number two, to accept the Water Commission's recommendations regarding the Water Department's Fiscal Year 2025 Operating and Capital Investment Program. And from item 21.2, motion to adopt a resolution amending the classification and compensation plans for the Fiscal Year 2025 Budget Personnel and Comp complement by implementing the approved fiscal year 2025 budget and position changes in several departments. 
and department heads and staff are here um, if you have any additional questions. Thank you. I wondered why all those bright, shiny faces were out there. <laughs> there we go. Okay, let me start with the council. Council's matters before the body, before we make a motion, see if you have questions or comments on the budget. And the uh, uh, thank you for the budget hearing follow up, and thank you for the amendments to it yesterday. Thank you. It's quite helpful. Let me see if there are questions and comments by members. Uh, the uh, Council Member Watkins is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just had a quick question around the examination of the impact of not charging the public safety impact fees for affordable housing. I also know that was associated with the child care impact fees, and I thought that was combined in terms of assessing both of them not being um, sure. applied and then looking into them both being applied. But as it's written and as it was presented, it just identified public safety. Thanks for that question, Councilmember Watkins, Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. And yes, um, when we come back in October, we will be um, including both the uh, analysis of the public safety impact fee as well as the child care impact okay. fee with some um, projected uh, um, uh, revenues that we would have received from prior projects as well as um, some uh, thoughts about uh, upcoming projects that would be exempt and where we would land if we're at different stages, like 25% collection, 50% collection, 75% collection, or 100% collection. So that um, gives you a preview of what we're currently thinking. Okay, perfect. I was just making sure that was included because I couldn't quite tell it wasn't clear from the... Sorry about that. The, the intent is to cover both. Great. That's all I asked. wanted to know. Thank you. Council, uh, the Vice Mayor is recognized. Council Member Bruner is recognized on the budget. Thank you. I had a question on the uh, follow-up memorandum, and that was um, around um, thank you for bringing back um, options identified for the purchase of a fire engine, a new fire apparatus, and our ongoing replacement plan. So there are many options listed that will be included if as options if we adopt this budget. But I, I'm, I'm a little unclear if we need to direct action to, to bring back a path forward on one of those options, because they're identified, but they're not, there's not a path forward still. And so time is of the essence, and so um, I'm wondering my question, I guess, is do I need to add additional clarification and direction to bring back? Uh, and you Let's see if the city manager wishes to respond. Chief Odie, would you come forward, please? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Councilmember Bruner. You'll note that in the memo, we outlined a number of possible options for pursuing purchase of additional apparatus. Um, it is our intent to bring something forward to the council within a three to six month period with those recommendations. If the council wanted to solidify that as part of a, a recommended direction to staff today, you could certainly do that. Chief, any additional comments on this item, sir? No, he covered it well. Uh, again, Thank Rob you. Odie, Fire Chief, just if you guys had specific questions, I'll be available if needed. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Yep. Councilmember Bruner, further on the budget? Thank you. Okay. Vice Mayor is recognized whether she's ready or not. All right. <laughs> right, here I go. So to be clear, we don't have to make that recommendation today. Staff is ready to move forward with replacement funding cycles. That's correct. Okay, got it. And then one other thing I didn't address during the last um, hearing, but I wanted to touch on, is with all of the new vertical development that we have, and I'm assuming some families and kids and older adults might want to have space to um, recreate, and I know we have a lot of... Um, land that we've preserved, which is great, but I'd like to see if in parks we could look at possibilities where we could add additional soccer fields, pickleball courts, basketball courts, things, roller skating, multi-use facilities throughout our, our parks system to help people enjoy the outdoors in an active way. And I know that's debatable. Some people think the, the bird watching and hiking and those things, and those are great as well, but I just was thinking some actual developed facilities similar to what we have at Depot or Harvey West where people can 
That uh, is near and dear to my heart, um, Vice Mayor Golder, so I appreciate you raising it. Um, been engaged in a lot of conversations with Tony Ellett, our Parks and Recreation Director. Investments in our parks and open space is really one of our uh, ongoing unmet needs and really the next area that we plan to tackle uh, with adoption of the budget today, looking at other infrastructure and financing options that we could explore to really make the investment. As uh, the mayor noted uh, earlier today, been great at preserving and protecting open space and parkland, uh, challenges maintaining it and really um, maintaining it at the standard that our community expects. So we're excited to embark in that work. We're also in the midst of a number of long range planning efforts in our parks, including San Lorenzo. We're about to embark on the Harvey West master plan as well. We've talked about Depot Park also. So with those long-term plans, we'll be able to start moving forward with, uh, with exciting investments. More to come. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone with us today who wishes to make comment on the budget? This would be your opportunity to do so. Anyone online, Ms. Bush? No one with their hand raised. No right. one with their hand up. Last call. Matters back before the council. A motion would be in order. Councilmember Brown. I would like to move the adoption of our fiscal year 2025 budget. I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but if you want to put the, um, is it possible to put those the recommendation up just so people can see it? So adoption of the budget, uh, accepting the Water Commission's recommendations regarding the Water Department's operating and capital investment program, and I would include the motion to adopt <coughs> a resolution amending the classification and compensation plans, with the corresponding budget items. There's a motion. Is there a second? A second by Council Member Bruner. Under debate and discussion. I, yeah, and I, I, I just wanted to add solidifying language to bring back three to six months some um, option, an option to move forward in ordering a, an engine, a fire apparatus. Thank you. Agreeable to second? It's agreeable to the mover. To the, mo the, mo to the, the motion maker. Me, to the person making the motion. It's agreeable. That will be added. Others? I just have one comment. Yes, please. Councilmember Watkins. I just want to follow up on a comment that the vice mayor raised in regards to development and proximity to open space. And when we had more discretion in the past over development, we could ask about whether or not there be outside space in some of these large developments. We could require some of that. That seems to also be something that we don't have as much discretion over anymore. But when thinking about it moving forward, I think um, as we know, we have incredible open space and parks in our community, and not everybody has access that's a walkable space. So thinking about small parklets or other types of solutions moving forward, I hope, is also considered. And it just brought that up for me when, when the vice mayor raised that point. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Further? Uh, couple of closing comments on the budget. First of all, thank you to the city manager, the finance team, and all of the department heads and your assistants and the people who all work with you. Uh, what do we have, five, 600 employees in the city, something on that order? Seven, 800, <laughs> 900? Uh, they're getting busier all the time. 900 people times eight hours a day times X number of days a year. I mean, it is, uh, you drive around the city of Santa Cruz and if you're not seeing a public works truck, then you see a park truck. And if not that, then a garbage truck. And if not that, a police car or a fire engine. Touch a truck, one of those doggone trucks is rolling around in front of you all the time. And I think what that says is that we are a full service city. And we, uh, we're not a contract city. We don't contract stuff out. We do it ourselves. And we, I think that uh, it's fair to say that our, our city employees and the administration do an excellent job of managing the precious resources that we have that we can direct into a budget to try to affect services in a, in a very high quality way, very intentional way in our city. Uh, budgeting is, uh, I, I've said it before, I think it's uh, the most important single vote that we cast every year is the budget. It is the uh, figuratively the blueprint for our plans for implementing our hopes and aspirations in public policy. Uh, I think we are very fortunate 
uh, in our city. Uh, when the state catches a cold, all the counties catch pneumonia. Uh, when the state catches a cold, uh, we might get the sniffles a little bit here and there, but we're not a subdivision of the state of California. We're a municipal corporation. As a consequence, we are somewhat more in charge of our own destiny, not the vagaries of the economy, certainly, but, uh, but by not being the provider, basically, of health and human services, that being done by the county of Santa Cruz, uh, we're in the direct service business in, in a way that is uh, in ways that are other than those two very important pieces. The, uh, I do want to comment on the budget process this year. Uh, I think that it, uh, the idea of moving from the way that budget hearings were held to the way they were held this time, I think it is an improvement in the following regard in that I think it is more efficient and effective. I think it might be too efficient, and I would like to consult with the city manager after we adopt this uh, the next month or so, think through with the budget and finance folks, uh, think through something uh, still much closer to what we did this year than in previous years, but I think maybe it's a little too truncated. So, so perhaps we, we expanded a bit. I think there's some, some ways to look at that. But I do appreciate the effort and the motivation behind the, the process this year. Uh, I think it was a uh, it was one that 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 worked well, uh, but maybe a little too well in terms of efficiency. Um, I will comment that that I, uh, I I'm I'm going to try to search. I've been searching for the word in thinking about making this comment. I don't know if my feeling is sad, perplexed. I'm not sure what it is, but there's something bubbling up from the neck down about the fact that we don't have more public interest in or participation in the budget. Uh, people will show up all year long talking about all kinds of things. And oftentimes, if, if you kind of track them where they go, they almost always have a place in the budget. And uh, we've talked a bit about perhaps some other things we can do in that regard, maybe a Citizens Budget Academy online, perhaps something at London Nelson a couple of days a year, something to try to get the public uh, more interested in and participating in giving us feedback on, on, on our annual budget. Uh, I, I think that what we do is we, we use our very best judgment about what comes forward to us and how does that in each departmental instance and each object and sub-object in the budget, I suspect every member goes through a process in their mind of saying, do I think this meets what I've heard from my constituents in the last year or so? Does this meet what I've heard at this hearing that went on for three and a half hours or whatever it might be? Is that a, are, are, are we getting to point on that? So uh, that's something I would also like to discuss with you and the comms folks who are, my goodness, are they good. They are very, very good. Uh, Ms. Smart is very good, and the people that work with and for her are quite good as well. Last comment is thank you all. Thank you all for being so good uh, about managing our budgets once they are adopted and helping build the budgets in the subsequent years. Uh, I believe that we are having worked in several levels of government uh, I think we are blessed in this little city government of ours of having incredibly high quality ethical people at every level of this little government of ours. And uh, they, they make us proud every day. And thank you all very much and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Palantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeler? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Mr. City Attorney, further business to come before the body. There is none. Ms. Bush. The Vice Mayor moves to adjourn. And let me see. Ms. Brown? Ms. Brown, deeply, with deep reluctance, seconds the motion to adjourn. Not debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. And we stand adjourned. Jeez, I didn't get thrown out for the